uh, good afternoon to everybody. It's a tremendous pleasure to introduce Professor Klaus Rajewski. Uh, it's even intimidating, I would say. Um, but I'll, I'll, I'll say a few words about his background. So uh, he obtained a medical de degree in Frankfurt, and then he moved for postdoctoral work at Pasteur Institute in Paris. And afterwards, since 1964, he started building an immunobiology, immunology unit at uh, Cologne Institute, uh, at the University of Cologne, where he stayed nearly 40 years, um, establishing a number of mouse models to address important questions in the biology of B cells. Since 2001, he worked for 10 years at Harvard, and then he returned to Germany to Max Delbruck, Institute, uh, Max Delbruck Center for Molecular Medicine in Berlin, where he works as a senior group leader. He's a recipient of numerous scientific awards, uh, um, just to mention to the National Academy of Sciences of the United States, and also the Jose, Jose Carreras Award. So when I last checked, there were over 30 papers in Nature, Science and Cell journals published by his lab. And um, more on the personal note, um, every time we start a new project, nearly every time we start a new project in the lab, we step on one of his uh, papers and it becomes a foundation for, for what we do. So his work uh, tremendously contributed to understanding that germinal centers of the lymph nodes are the site for the development of uh, immune response to the fact that B-cell receptor signaling is a key survival pathway in B-cells and that the germinal centers are actually the place where a lot of the lymphomas develop. So um, what I would like to do on the behalf of Masaryk University is to present Dr. Rajewski with a Mendel medal. And now, actually, the floor is yours uh, for the talk, so please go ahead. Which is, expresses um, and which goes inside the cell and activates certain signaling pathways, in particular this PS3 kinase signaling. Uh, it integrates signal coming from this receptor with signals coming from co-receptors of the cells, which, uh, which are important in the activation of the cells. And that is, uh, that is actually a, a very important um, um, uh, uh, this, uh, uh, principle because uh, the B cell is, is, is going to recognize pathogens if they come into the body and then uh, that is doing through this B cell receptor specifically recognizing certain structures on the pathogen but the pathogen is also driving uh, the B cell response by interacting with other receptors for example toll-like receptors they are called this innate immunity and uh, somehow the B cell response has to be uh, 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 controlled by an, uh, an integration of, this, uh, of the signal to the B cell receptor and these uh, co-receptors. So just one word about antibody diversity so that you really understand the also the elegance of that system. Uh, in each B cell, there is a process which is called VDJ recombination, which is a, a recombination between uh, different elements in the, in the, on the DNA of the cell. Uh, and, and this leads in each, each single cell to a particular VDJ joint, which is actually expressed as a variable region on the, on the protein of the B-cell receptor. And a similar thing happens to the, to the light chain of this uh, receptor. And so, so it comes that, uh, that every B-cell expresses only one receptor of a particular specificity, and the next B-cell will, will recognize a different specificity. 
And that, that is called clonal selection, discovered by Burnett uh, a, a long time ago, and still the basis of the, of the B cell system. So, so just a few words about, uh, about how this is all managed in the development of the B cell. At the end, you see a B cell with the, with the receptor on the surface. The cell starts out from what is called hematopoietic stem cells, uh, which uh, develop in the bone marrow. Some of these cells go into the B cell lineage, and then in the B cells, in, in the classical uh, scheme, the cells would first uh, rearrange the genes for the heavy chain in the antibody receptor, and then they would uh, stop this, and they would uh, begin to rearrange uh, genes for the light chain in the receptor, and at the end, the cell will express a fully uh, mature B-cell receptor, which has one particular specificity. And I just want to, to add one thing for the, uh, for the uh, connoisseurs in this. There is, uh, at this point where the cells uh, express the light chain genes, they, they, they choose the light chains from many different possibilities. They rearrange and rearrange and rearrange until they make a light chain which will fit together with a heavy chain to make a functional B cell receptor in the mature cells. So that's, uh, that, that's how this uh, thing works. So now uh, I want to come to the first uh, uh, part of this talk where I want to talk about something specific in the, in the B cell response. And that is, uh, that is the generation of immunological memory. That is a fundamental feature of the immune system. It, it can remember the first encounter with an antigen, and then upon a second encounter with the antigen come up with a vigorous response. We all experience this nowadays in SARS-CoV-2 uh, vaccination, where after the first vaccination, hopefully, we don't get a second one. Uh, I got my COVID after the vaccinations, by the way, but that's just an aside. Uh, so so, so uh, that's how, how, in principle, this works. You have the naive B cell, it gets activated by the pathogen, and then the cells expand and uh, develop through two different routes into what is called the memory B cell compartment. And that, uh, that can either happen through this uh, uh, usual thing, the cells just grow and then there are many more cells uh, remaining, but it can also work through, uh, through a special pathway, and that is, uh, that is what I want to talk a little bit about. That is the, the uh, maturation, as one says, of the B cells in the germinal center response. A uh, very special organ in uh, or, 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 uh, uh, lymphoid structure uh, developing after immunization, where the where the cells uh, undergo what is called affinity maturation, and that is uh, that is a process by which. Uh, antibodies which are encoded by the naive cell and which have some affinity for this immunizing antigen uh, are selected for higher affinity to the antigen. And that happens through a process of mutation, of somatic mutation of the genes which are encoding antigen specificity. Um, so, so, so now I go back in my own past uh, 30 years, I'm keeping changing this. Uh, a little while ago, it was 25 years, now it's 30 years. Um, the, the, when we started to study these processes, at a time when molecular biology just became available for the study of the immune response. So it was good times, uh, new experiments, uh, and so forth. So, so uh, this is my group at the time, and uh, they are actually interesting people here. You, you wouldn't know them, but, but I do, and I could tell stories about this. But uh, there were two people here, Ursula Weiss, uh, she is now actually uh, editing your papers for Nature. So when you, when you want to get a paper accepted, it's usually uh, through her. And then uh, Ralph Küpper, who is a professor at uh, Essen University nowadays, they started to do something which was uh, uh, completely new at the time. Uh, namely, they started to pick uh, individual cells 
uh, from germinal centers, like uh, this is a germinal center here, with many cells inside, and each each uh, dot here is a cell they picked uh, from uh, fr from histological sections, or also from tumor cells. Uh, these are Hodgkin Reed Sternberg cells from Hodgkin lymphoma, where th these guys uh, had the courage, uh, actually I should say, to pick uh, individual nuclei, and then by the newly discovered chain uh, polymerase, polymerase chain reaction amplify. Uh, v genes from from these cells, from in single copy V genes from the DNA of those cells, and that uh, that led to discoveries. Uh, one, one discovery was that inside the germinal center, from one germinal center, you would pick this kind of uh, of uh, uh, of sequences, which uh, were were the same. VDJ rearrangement, but they differed by somatic mutations, which you can see as individual dots here. Um, so that said that in loco, in the germinal center, the cells were expanding and undergoing somatic point mutation. And actually, one, one could, uh, from this kind of thing, one, one could, what many people have done, uh, of course, uh, 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 one could uh, construct these genealogical trees where, where one cell would, di would divide and then accumulate mutations and then end up with a somatic mu mutated progeny. And so th that's the principle of it. Uh, there's a primary repertoire expressed in naive cells with, with uh, germline encoded rearrangements. And then uh, after activation, the cells would go into the germinal center, would proliferate, uh, would somatically hypermutate by putting in these point mutations. And then high affinity cells would be selected into the secondary repertoire. And, and this secondary repertoire is then expressed as in memory cells generated from this uh, somatic hypermutation process. So that's, uh, that's basically how it works. This is a modern scheme of the germinal center reactions where the cells, the B cells, the naive cells, are activated by antigen, go into the germinal center, the so-called dark zone, uh, where they proliferate and hypermutate. Uh, then they go into what's called the light zone. They are selected there. The, high, the cells with high affinity uh, are selected and can go back into the germinal center. It's sort of a cyclic process. Uh, and then at some point the cells go out of the germinal center reaction and become either memory B cells which persist or they become antibody secreting plasma cells. So just again in terms of timing, um, at that time when, when these things were becoming clear, uh, there was also becoming available uh, the technology of, of, of introducing targeted mutations into cells and mice in order to study function, gene targeting. And uh, this is, uh, this is the, the classical scheme of, uh, of uh, the, uh, Smithies, Kapeki and Evans, got the Nobel Prize for this, where you have uh, the so-called embryonic stem cells, which you can mutagenize in, in culture, then you can select the, the mutants you want, you can introduce them into mouse embryos, and in the end generate mutant mice which carry the mutation in the germline. That was, of course, a revolution. We, we immediately studied, started to work on this. And um, the, in, in my lab, actually, uh, a certain fellow in the lab, this, this one, Hua Gu, a Chinese uh, student at that time, uh, he was... Uh, uh, um, uh, he was improving this technology by introducing the Crelox recombination system, which I'm sure many of you know. Uh, this is a system where you can do many things. You can, you can change uh, in the, in the orientation of a gene. You can exchange genes against one, again, mouse genes against human genes. But you can also uh, do one thing which became a sort of a blow. And that is, uh, you can label cells 
in a mouse by, by flanking them with log p sites, which are uh, just sequences, short sequences of, uh, of nucleotides. And then uh, by using a recombinase Cree, so log p Cree system, uh, which is expressed in, in mice under the control of a cell type specific uh, promoter, you can then mutagenize the gene specifically in certain cells. Uh, and that was, uh, uh, that, that was, uh, that's used, uh, I think uh, still many of you may be using that system because it's a very universal type of thing. And for us it was, uh, it was a fantastic tool because uh, we studied B cell development, which I've just explained in bone marrow cells. B cells develop, then they go out into the periphery as mature cells, they go into the germinal center and become memory cells or plasma cells. And uh, we had, uh, we had uh, uh, Cree lines, developed Cree lines, which could uh, mark the cells, which would mutagenize the cells if you want, at every stage of this process. So, so now one could do mutagenesis of, of the cells of interest uh, at, at different developmental times. And so now comes my, my first uh, little story. Um, the, and the first story is, is, is asking a specific question. Uh, and that is the question whether immunological memory is really true memory. And that is, is it actually distinguished from what might be lifelong immunity, for example, let's say a virus uh, infects you, EBV, Epstein-Barr virus, for example, it, it stays in the body for a lifetime. And it could be that the memory cells developing to EBV could be just sustained by continuous contact with the persisting virus. But, but of course, true immunological memory would be would be independent of the immunizing antigen. You would, you would see the antigen, you would generate long-lived cells which would persist independent of this antigen. And when the antigen comes again, you would develop your secondary response. So we, 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 had, uh, we tried to address this, uh, this problem uh, with, a, with, a, with an, a gene targeting experiment. Um, this is shown here. Uh, so, so it's actually in principle a simple system. You immunize a mouse uh, with an antigen which is recognized by this original uh, uh, antibody which is formed by a particular VDJ rearrangement, and of course the light chain which is also in the game. Okay, so the mice, the mice would now activate cells expressing this and would generate memory cells. And, uh, and, and this you can, you can show these memory cells, they are binding an antigen, it is called NP or NIP. And, uh, and you can see this uh, when, you, when you look at the cells by flow cytometry, you can show that there are these memory cells generated, okay? And then uh, after some time you do a, 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 a Crelox mediated uh, genetic manipulation in the mice, and that is you, you, you delete inducively uh, the, 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 the variable region gene which was originally expressed by the cells and by, by inversion of a second uh, VDJ element which, is, uh, which was not expressed in the original mice, which is now inverted, you, you, put, you give the cells a different receptor. The receptor against something which they have never seen before. In that case, a fluorescent antigen is called PE, phycoerythrin, by which you can very nicely label the cells. And then uh, you ask the question whether when, when the cells have inverted their receptor and see something which the mouse has never seen before, will the cells also persist? A simple, uh, in principle, a simple experiment. That, that's uh, how it looks. So uh, here's first a control. You have to, uh, you generate memory cells by immunization of the mice, and the mice uh, generate these memory cells which bind NP, and they persist over long periods of time. I think it's 110 days in, in that experiment, and they are uh, they are constantly there. There's no there are non-dividing cells, resting cells which persist. But now, <coughs> now you do this uh, 
manipulation, you, you, there's an induce, interferon inducible switch, so you expose the mice for, you give them one shot of interferon or, or some analog of it. And then uh, some of the cells will now invert their receptor and will become PE binding cells. Th that is an antigen which the mouse has never seen. It's uh, something completely unrelated. And uh, then you just look at, at those cells in the animals. And when you do that, you, you find that the PE binding cells, they appear here, uh, they persist uh, exactly like the NP binding ones. There's no change. So that says uh, that, uh, that these cells are persisting independent of the immunizing antigen. I think it's just a, that's just how it is. So <laughs> uh, the uh, question answered. Uh, we have done a lot of uh, experiments on the, on the nature of those cells. Are they resting cells? Are they, are they responding to the new antigen and, and all this? I don't uh, show you this. It's, it's all working out fine. They also have actually mutated the genes uh, specifically for the new antigen in the course of a German center response as passenger antigens. Uh, but, but, uh, but the results uh, just stand as this. And so the conclusion at the time and I, 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 I have deceived you a little bit. This experiment was actually done in the year 2000, so it's uh, 23 years ago. But uh, I talked about it recently in the immunology conference, and nobody in the audience remembered this, actually. <laughs> <laughs> so we, we could have also done it now. Okay. The, the conclusion was <laughs> that, that, uh, that uh, the, through somatic hypermutation, the German center B cell response mediates the production of long-lived memory cells with high affinity for, but independent of the immunizing antigen. And uh, one speculation which we added to this uh, that that uh, what I now think is the main function of the German center response actually is that uh, the, the German center response uh, may may long uh, generate long lived memory cells that have mutated away from the immunizing antigen and actually recognize something which might come in the future uh, related to this antigen, for example, antigenic pa uh, pathogen variants which arise later on. And I think here we are right in the center of present day uh, COVID vaccination, uh, COVID infection uh, uh, immunology, because that's what we really want, isn't it? We want our immunizations to take care of, uh, of uh, forthcoming uh, antigenic variants. To which extent that's really happening, there's a, there's a lot of research done on, the, on these kinds of things presently, which I I'm happy to discuss. I have no, don't have time here, but, uh, the, but, but this is an urgent question. And actually, the kind of genetic switch which I described to you is going to be used in the next years by, by several groups with whom I'm now in contact. We are exchanging mice, and uh, we are investigating this more modern technologies of looking at repertoires of, of somatic mutants and so forth, something which in the year 2000 we couldn't really do. We, we looked at something like maybe 20 sequences. Now we are going to look, and, and my colleagues are going to look at, uh, at thousands of sequences in, in, in this kind of system. So that was my, <laughs> my first... Uh, 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 part. My second part uh, uh, of this talk is, is going to deal with B cell malignancies. And that's, uh, that's also something which, in, for my own experience, goes back to these same years in the, in the early 90s and, um, and uh, led actually to this, uh, to this kind of scheme, which at the time was, was uh, sorry, which at the time was. Uh, oh, so now I did something absolutely horrible. Sorry. I went back to the end of the talk for some reason. Um, this one, I don't know what I did here. I did something terrible. 
Just bear with me for one moment. Ah, I know what is wrong. Okay. Don't worry. It's okay. No, 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 don't worry. <laughs> it's no problem. It's, 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 don't worry. It's okay. Oh, we need to. <laughs> this is the devil of this. This is terrible. <laughs> Maybe that's on purpose that this machine. <laughs> okay, now we go forward. Oh. <laughs> it was okay. Ah, thank you very much. Now I think we are back in... This is the one we want to do. No, it is. Yeah. Okay. Wonderful. Thank you. Sorry for this. I had. I just had a, an experience. I, I'm shocked somehow because I come from Vienna, where I gave a talk. Okay, and in the middle of the talk, I couldn't move my slides anymore. It was. It was. I can't even think of it. <laughs> Anyway, uh, you know, in 1993, when, when we did these experiments on somatic mutation, okay, uh, 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 colleagues of mine and many people in the world actually sequenced human malignancies, human lymphomas, B-cell lymphomas, and they found out that in most cases, the, uh, the B-cell lymphomas originated from cells which had undergone somatic hypermutation by just sequencing the genes, V genes. And that, of course, had an immediate implication, namely that these, all these tumors came, came from germinal center B cell progenitors. And you can see that on this slide. This is a, this is a slide showing a, 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 a B cell follicle in the organism with, with a germinal center here in the, in the middle. And uh, except a few uh, lymphomas, uh, for example, mantle cell lymphoma, uh, all these other diseases here uh, came from either germinal center or post-germinal center cells, which said that the germinal center is a cancerogenic environment. It's an environment generating uh, these lymphomas. And of course, the, the, the reason for that is obvious when you think about it, because in the German center there is, there is a somatic hypermutation which goes along with DNA breaks in, in, the, in the V genes. Okay? That can, of course, lead to translocations to other genes in the genome. And that, that is what is at the, at, the, at, the, at the origin of a lot of these B-cell tumors. And also there's class switching, I haven't talked about this, but there's another process going along with, uh, with DNA breaks, uh, again, uh, making the germinal center just a d dangerous environment for, 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 for lymphoma genesis. And in fact, uh, when you look at the overall situation, uh, uh, B-cell lymphomas are by far the most frequent uh, uh, hematological malignancies because of this. So, so, so that was an, an obvious thing, and uh, we, we published this article uh, in, in the New England Journal of Medicine at the time uh, about this scenario. And uh, then we started to work ourselves on, on, on trying to model uh, human uh, lymphomas in mice. 
And the first, uh, the first thing we just want to mention is we, we, we had started our work on, on classical Hodgkin's disease, Hodgkin's lymphoma. Hodgkin's lymphoma is a very strange tumor because there is enormous tumors, but in the tumor there are only about 1% of the cells are the tumor cells. They are called Hodgkin Reed Sternberg cells. They were very peculiar cells. And at the time, nobody knew where these, where these cells came from because there was no counterpart in the normal hemopoietic system. And so that was where, 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 where this guy, um, the, uh, Ralph Cooper, started to pick uh, the nuclei of single Hodgkin Reed Sternberg cells in collaboration with people in the clinic, and then, uh, then found that these cells were in every patient were clonal cells. It was one clone of cells which had undergone the germ center mutation because, because they were somatically carried somatically mutated V genes. And uh, then he also found that in many of these cells, uh, the, the, the V genes had actually undergone what we call crippling mutations, mutations which put in a stop codon into the variable region gene, and therefore it, the, the antibody could not be expressed anymore. The cells didn't look like B cells, but they were transformed by some other uh, events, for example, Epstein-Barr virus infection, which is happening in, in a, a, a pretty large percentage of Hodgkin, Hodgkin's lymphoma. So there was immediately a disease scenario of Hodgkin's disease, which uh, curiously enough, we have of course tried, and many other people have tried to model this really in the mouse. Uh, no success so far. We, we, we know what originally happens, but, but how it works is, is still nowadays a mystery. So, um, so I want to talk about uh, another uh, tumor uh, that's, uh, that's just actually going, the, uh, going to be the, the last part of this lecture, uh, uh, namely just one uh, tumor which we try to model now, now really recently, not 2000, but, but, uh, we, but uh, we work on this, we still work on this actually. <laughs> Uh, and that is multiple myeloma. Now, I'm sure you, you know what multiple myeloma is. These are actually the people who, who worked on this. Uh, Martin Jans is the, our collaborating group leader and, uh, and uh, Wiebke, the main person involved in this. Um, so multiple myeloma is a, is a, a frequent disease. It's a, it's a tumor of, uh, of uh, terminally differentiated B cells, uh, plasma cells. And um, it, is a, it is a tumor which, uh, which homes mostly to the bone marrow. In, in patients develop this tumor in the, in the bone marrow. Uh, uh, which, which, uh, which uh, where these plasma cells accumulate. There are certain uh, diagnostic criteria for this, which uh, I'll show you in a moment, a particular one, these bone lesions. There are, there are bone lesions, these patients get bone lesions, uh, which are very painful, actually. Uh, and, and you can diagnose this uh, tumor often by looking at the blood, at the, at the plasma actually in the blood, where, where, where the myeloma cells would generate uh, so-called M-spikes, M-proteins, which are the myeloma protein produced by this particular plasma cell which has become a tumor. It's a monoclonal disease usually, and so you get uh, one uh, very strong band in the serum uh, uh, separated here by electrophoresis, which is typical for these, uh, uh, for these patients. Uh, now, uh, the, the interesting thing is that uh, multiple myeloma goes through uh, uh, different sequential stages. Initially, you, it starts from a post-germinal or, or germinal center B cell. Then you get uh, one gets a disease which is called MGUS, which is uh, where people have already spikes in the in the serum M spikes, but they have not yet uh, uh, real disease. And then, uh, uh, in the end, one, one gets the the, the the real tumor. And uh, these, uh, these stages are, uh, are connected to different genetic events. That's, the, that's uh, what I want to really want to talk about. There's, uh, there's, uh, there are early 
um, the genetic uh, events, mutations, by which one comes to the stage of MGAS, and then there are later events uh, like MIC activation, nf kappa b signaling, and, and so forth, by which one uh, uh, transits to the stage of, of, of real disease. Okay? And, um, uh, and, and, and of these initial events, uh, about 50% are uh, immuno uh, translocations of, of driver genes into the immunoglobulin loci, that's due to these breaks, which uh, occurred during the German center reaction. And, and these uh, driver uh, uh, genes can be different ones. You know, there, are, there, are, there are groups of uh, multiple express overexpressed cyclins. Uh, there are groups which overexpress a, a molecule called MMZ, that is a histone uh, methyl transferase. And there are other ones which express the transcription factor MAF. Uh, this is a particular aggressive disease. And, and, and the important thing about this is that, uh, th that these different tumors uh, are really different diseases. They have, they have different uh, uh, gene expression profiles, they, they have different uh, treatment strategies, or treatment strategies are being developed. And, uh, and, um, uh, and so, so what one really would like to have are, are, are subgroup-specific um, animal models of this disease to, to approach uh, potential therapies, for example. So that's what we what we try to do, um, uh, and the uh, the um, system is is relatively simple. So you you introduce uh, the first mutation uh, and the second mutation, uh, for example, MMZ trans overexpression plus uh, uh, NF kappa B activation into germinal center cells in the mouse, and then you you just look. Uh, whether you will get a myeloma model out of it, okay? So, so, so that's exactly what we, we did. We used uh, uh, conditional gene targeting. We had a, our germinal center-specific uh, Cree line here. And then uh, by deleting a stop cassette in, in front of the, of, the, of the genes of interest which you put into the mice, we, we, we activated these genes in germinal centers and then looked what happened, what happens. There's just a log P system. Uh, so, so, so that's the experiment. The experiment is you, you, you have these mice, okay, they have the two mutations put into the germinal center environment at a certain frequency. And then, uh, then you, we immunize the mice to, to, to induce really germinal center reactions. And then, uh, then we just wait. And, uh, and the interesting thing, that's why I tell you the story really that is that when you look when we look at uh, very late after the after the induction of the process 80 to 95 weeks or so in the mice we see this absolutely dramatic uh, phenotype I show you here's one example uh, uh, where, where, where we have the different control animals, controls, MMZ only animals, IKK, nf cover b signaling only animals, and then the MMZ plus A IKK 2A uh, nf cover b signaling mice, and then uh, only in these mice, uh, after one and a half years or so, uh, the bone marrow is just pure myeloma, Okay, and uh, and you can see that there are myeloma cells because where when you stain for for Ig immunoglobulin expression, you see this dramatic uh, staining throughout the bone marrow where most of the cells are now uh, malignant plasma cells. So 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 uh, I I was uh, I was very much surprised by this result because. Because uh, not only because of this time length, I mean, of course, we don't really know what happens over the time, but, but there must be, there must be a, uh, uh, a process going on which leads only to the production of myeloma cells. We don't see other tumors. We don't see uh, DLBCL-like cells or, or, or marginal zone type cells. It's, it's this combination of transgenes who are cell genes which are activated in human myelomas leads specifically to the outgrowth of these cells. 
I'll just show you another example. That, that was MM set. This is the situation in the case of cyclin, where you see that, that in these diseased mice, uh, the bone marrow is just absolutely full of these, uh, of these plasma cells. Now, are these plasma cells really uh, transformed cells? I mean, they, they, they make M spikes, uh, like we can see here, the mice produces, the, uh, they are often uh, clonal or largely clonal uh, uh, cells, not, not, not yet completely, because it's probably too early. It's, an, it's maybe an early MGUS uh, stage at that point. But, uh, but, uh, but, uh, but we also see very spectacularly, actually, these bone lesions in the animals, which are, which are the, one of the hallmarks of, uh, of myeloma. It's, it's, it's really absolutely striking. Other symptoms also, which I don't have time to go in. And uh, we also find by gene expression profiling, uh, this is a principal component analysis here, that, the, that, that different myelomas characterized, by, in this case, the cyclin D1 group, and in this case, the MM set group, they are really completely different tumor entities. They, they, are, they are really distinct from each other. These are different diseases uh, determined by the, by the uh, classical uh, oncogenic events happening in, in mouse myeloma, in human myeloma subgroups. And uh, this is, uh, I will not go into this now, it, 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 it shows that, the, that when you compare the gene expression profiles of these, uh, of these uh, uh, groups of uh, myelomas or of disease, they show overlap with the, uh, co with the, with the um, corresponding human subgroups of myeloma. So there's a, there's a real similarity here, which of course we want to uh, investigate further. And I, I just want to uh, uh, come to one final point, which, uh, which is, uh, uh, I think, particularly important. We can, we can take these uh, plasma cells developing in, in the mice in situ and can uh, propagate them in, in recipients. That is to say, we can propagate the disease and we can use this potentially for drug tests uh, which may be close to, closer to practice than these mouse models by themselves are. And that just shows you that this is, uh, this is possible. Uh, there are histological analyses. There's, there are just these numbers where you see that these plasma cells grow out to enormous numbers in the, in the recipient host. And uh, they are, of course, producing M spikes, as one uh, would expect. And so um, uh, with this, um, uh, here is the summary of, the, of these uh, multiple myeloma subgroup experiments. We, we can model uh, uh, these subgroups in, in mice by, by the specific expression of the, of the uh, known, uh, uh, known from the human uh, uh, driver genes, the primary plus secondary. We get uh, a, a very strong uh, myeloma phenotype and we can uh, process these cells uh, in, 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 in vitro and secondary hosts so that we can actually begin to analyze the sensitivities of these cells uh, in, in the, in with a therapeutic uh, option. And uh, so that's, that's actually exactly how long I wanted to talk. So, so uh, th uh, thank you very much for your attention. I just want to show you the present group of my people in, in Berlin. Um, Wiebke is also here somewhere. I can't recognize it now, but she's also on the picture. <laughs> and, uh, and, uh, and just uh, uh, the collaborators, uh, some, some grant support. We have other grant support. Th thank you very much for your attention. So the talk is opened for questions now. 
I know that it always, ta always takes time before someone asks the first one, so I'll, I'll do that. And meanwhile, you can, you can think <laughs> about it. So um, I have a question about the concept of long-lived and memory B cells that you very nicely explained in mice. In humans, we are dealing with a time situation that is even much longer in the range of decades. My question is, when we look in very old humans, 80 plus, or maybe relatively old, 80 plus, we see that a lot of these people have relatively monoclonal population or oligoclonal populations of B cells. So, and, and the question is, is it because they repeatedly encounter the same antigens, so kind of the same B cells expand, or is it actually a feature of the B cell receptor on those B cells that is unrelated to antigen binding that makes them more fit and to overgrow the rest of the other B cells? Yeah, that, uh, that, uh, <coughs> I think that's a very good uh, uh, question. I've often been thinking about this, actually. But uh, uh, my conclusion is, uh, unfortunately, uh, that we haven't done uh, uh, the, the, the right experiments to, to test this, because I think it would it would really de depend on 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 a on a thorough analysis of the receptors of those cells. That would be, would be the first thing, um, uh, and also on the uh, on the genetic uh, on, on background mutations in the cells, which might drive this. I think nobody knows this really. I think it's a, it's a it's a very it's a very interesting. I, I'm sure I have a lot of these cells now in in my body, and uh, first of all, uh, I, I I I don't know whether I would like to know actually, but it would be interesting to know. <laughs> but it would be of course extremely important to understand why that is. Uh, it's a good question. I can't answer it. I I, I think it's a, it's something to be investigated. Why don't you... Uh... <laughs> <laughs> I, I, I think there are some people in the field of chronic lymphocytic leukemia that um, are trying to maybe understand that. Um, but yeah, I, I agree that it's a very difficult question to address um, experimentally. I mean, in a certain sense, um, I think the message from from uh, from malignancies in in the hemopathic system is that whenever you start with a with a polyclonal proliferating cell population and you end up with a tumor, the tumor is going to be monoclonal because because there's always some cell which is the fittest one uh, which is going to 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 survive best and I like to look at these uh, at, the, uh, at these B cells in old people like this, they are particularly fit, uh, I would think, in some way, and it's probably ge genetically determined, I, I would think. I, I think always like this, so it doesn't mean anything. It's, it's just my way of uh, addressing things. Uh, uh, that they are also, uh, they are just the fittest cells. But of course, you know, there's environment and, and, and there's... Uh, I could probably ask more questions, but let's give a chance to the audience. Thank you very much. Uh, I have a question regarding the uh, somatic hypermutation that you mentioned that is happening in the B cells. Uh, are there any mechanisms known by which the cells are trying to protect the rest of their g genome, right? Because ideally you want to have this hypermutation to happen locally, right, just at the genes and because you mentioned that uh, many of these diseases and pathologies are connected exactly as a side, to the, or they are originating as a side effect of this hypermutation. So are there any mechanisms how cells try to prevent this? Thank you. Well, uh, I mean, I think the, the first uh, thing to say about it <coughs> is that the somatic mutation mechanism is, uh, is pretty well understood now, molecularly. There, there are genes known to in be involved in this and so forth. It's, it's targeted uh, very specifically 
to the to the to the V genes in, in, in to rearrange the V genes actually, uh, and also to the class which uh, to the to, to the points where, where class switch recombination is happening. Okay, so it is very much targeted, and that is uh, that is a, a prerequisite for this because otherwise, I mean, the cells would uh, would just completely succumb to this. It's a, it's a mutation frequency with three orders of magnitude over the the background somatic mutation frequency, so it would be incompatible with life. But 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 sometimes it just goes wrong, and 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 that's what we see in these in these uh, lymphomas, and we we see it often. It probably happens actually much more frequently, because I think in many cases when it happens, the cells just die because they, they make an overshooting repair response and God knows what. Sometimes it, 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 it works in the wrong way and you get malignancies. I think that's, uh, that's just a price to pay uh, for, the, for the ability to undergo somatic mutation and affinity maturation of the antibodies. I think that's, uh, that's basically the, the idea about yeah, it. Yeah, thanks a lot. Maybe a follow up on the on the mouse models you introduced. So, if you look at the glo at this globally, are there any B cell malignancies that are not yet well modeled in mouse? I, I didn't understand. Actually, I'm sorry. No, it's the question of, of on the mouse models of of the B cell malignancies. So, okay. So, if you can comment on if there are any particular lymphomas or other B cell malignancies that are very well modeled by the genetic models in mouse. Yes. And, the, and on oh, the yeah. other side, that are really the challenge, and uh, the, the good models don't exist. Well, some sometimes uh, that's a very important question because it is actually asked uh, by many people in many different contexts, actually. But uh, but but sometimes the mouse models are incredibly faithful. Sometimes, uh, for example, let's say a tumor like Burkitt lymphoma. Uh, can be modeled in the mouse uh, uh, really faithfully. It, it, it looks, it looks like a, like a Burkitt lymphoma in the human. Uh, that is, of course, not uh, necessarily um, the case for all tumors, because I mean sometimes uh, human biology is different from mouse biology. But I think the in, the, uh, in general the 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 perception is that you can model these things. In some cases, very well. In some cases, pretty well. Uh, uh, and, and and of course, you know, uh, you want to get these models because uh, because to to work on, for example, uh, therapeutics, you might very well find leads in in, in systems like that to to develop uh, uh, therapies, which is not so easy in human. On the other hand, you can also propagate human tumors in immunodeficient mice and then you can you can you can try to do similar uh, uh, therapeutic attempts but but that's not easy i mean you you, you know you have uh, every patient is different you uh, it's a it's a problem in itself so so you have to you have to decide yourself uh, what kind of thing you want to do i must say my own uh, um, my own uh, scientific original motivation has never been, uh, maybe unfortunately, uh, 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 translational medicine or so. I, I just wanted to understand things. So, so, so I, I'm not the best person to, to, uh, to, to, uh, to, to deal with that at length. Thank, Thank you, you for the question. <laughs> Genic model with MSET and IKK that develops multiple myeloma. Uh, can you explain, like, how does it work mechanistically? Uh, why don't they develop lymphomas or, or other B cell malignancies? So, is MSET specific for differentiation to, to plasma cells, or, or how does it work? Well, I mean, it's uh, 
a good question. I mean, cyclin, the cyclins are an obvious uh, thing. Overexpression might lead to increased proliferation, of course. Um, in the case of, uh, of the, uh, methyl trans uh, the, the histone methyl transferase, MMZ, mm -hmm. this, is, uh, this is a very interesting question because um, uh, this is specific in humans for myeloma. Okay, the, the MMZ translocation is known for myeloma cells. Mm -hmm. uh, it, is a, it is an enzyme which is doing genome-wide um, alterations of, of histone methylation. We've shown that in the mouse model as well. It's happening exactly the same. The, 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 the whole genome is, is now plastered by, by certain methylation patterns, others are suppressed. Mm -hmm. Uh, it is opening to, le it's, it's leading to opening of chromatin, uh, but, but what it does specifically and why it works specifically in these plasma cells, totally unknown. Okay. But it, it, uh, uh, that's what uh, will be nice to try to find out, really. I, I, I'm, I'm, I'm really looking forward to this, but at the moment it's not known. Okay. It's just... The fascinating thing is that you, you take from the human these mutations which you know from myeloma, you put them into the mouse germinal center, okay, and you get exactly the same kind of tumors out of it. Only these tumors. Yeah. Yeah, Amazing. Yeah. Yeah. Thank yeah. you. Yeah. We have another question. I might have one more uh, kind of a gu guessing prediction question. So. Um, you have done a lot of work on the BCR signaling, characterizing how it works in normal B cells and in lymphomas. Now we have the BCR signaling inhibitors that are given to patients with lymphomas and um, chronic lymphocytic leukemia. From all the knowledge that you, you gather, where would you guess or predict that the resistance mechanism will arise to these uh, inhibitors? other than maybe having the mutation in the kinase that is hit, but what would be the alternative pathways that are activated in these resistance well, okay. cells? Okay, I mean, uh, 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 good question again. Uh, yeah, I, I, I tell you one thing, we, we, know, uh, we know something about this in the case of, uh, of Burkitt lymphoma, uh, due to the work which, uh, which which Stefano Casola, one of my former collaborators, has done in, uh, at EFOM in, in, in Milan. And that is uh, that, that uh, Burkitt lymphoma is actually was known to be a tumor which is uh, IgM positive, strongly positive, uh, 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 driven by MYC translocations, okay? And, uh, and, 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 and apparently dependent on the BCR because, we, because the cells are BCR strongly positive, it fits with the, with the concepts, okay? But then, then uh, it turns out that, uh, and that, that is actually uh, due to mouse models of this, that you, that you can overcome the dependence of these cells to immunoglobulin expression, to antibody expression, by secondary mutations. Uh, in that case, uh, known in that case, RAS activating mutations. If the cells acquire this, they get rid of their dependence on the on surface immunoglobulin. And you now get actually Burkitt lymphoma tumors, which you can show in the histology are completely blank. They, are, they have no immunoglobulin expression, but they have acquired uh, RAS activating mutation, a particular RAS activating mutation, which overcomes this. And that fits, that fits perfectly between the mouse model actually and, the, and what you see in humans. So that's, that's one way to, to overcome this. I'm sure there, mu there must be many others. So thank you very much. I think we can conclude the, the session for today. Thank you. Thank you very much. <laughs>